Hello Rebel and welcome to The Whole Nine Yards, the new recap series for G-Man Division 9. Uh, this is of course Harring Zord and I am doing a recap series for the very first time. So hopefully it'll all go well and you guys will enjoy the, the weekly show. Uh, we're hopefully, we're not going to make them too lengthy. Um, I've got various ideas in my head about the way I want this to, to look and to go. But we will see if it works. Um, so if you're a G-Man 9 coach, you'll be hearing a lot from me over the course of this season. And whether that's a good or a bad thing is, of course, completely your opinion. Uh, this is the bottom G-Man returning division. And as such, there's only one playoff spot available. So the competition is going to be fierce amongst the 14 teams who are here. The records of these teams last season weren't necessarily the best, which is why they've ended up in the bottom returning division. But of course, that means that they're playing against coaches of their own level. So everyone should be around about a similar, maybe not necessarily a similar sort of experience level, but a similar sort of skill level, certainly. Um, or it might just be that they're playing a team that takes a few seasons to develop up. And one or two ramp up coaches in here from last season as well so before we go into looking at the teams what we're going to do is have a quick look at a, a racial breakdown a sort of style breakdown of all the teams in this division just for a sort of overview of how division nine is shaping up okay so here is the team style breakdown for you for the teams in division nine and it, it's fairly even across the board we've got five bash teams in there three outright agility teams, otherwise known as Elves or Skaven. Uh, and then six hybrid teams. Though that, that figure of six, it has to be said, it very much depends on where you classify lizards in this whole bash hybrid or agility equation. Uh, I've got them down as a hybrid team because I'm not having skinks as bashy players, but some people do have them as a bash team. Uh, it very much depends how you build your lizard teams, of course. Uh, you can build them in a, in a bashy kill manner or of course a more control uh, style uh, the, the other thing as well no stunty teams in this division which is kind of a shame would have been nice to see one of the stunty teams uh, from last season's fresh divisions carry on but it wasn't to be so we've just got regular old good teams which of course does increase the competition it might mean that everyone has to work that little bit harder to get that first place all right, so here are the, the bash teams, as you can see. We've got one dwarf team, an orc team, two undead teams, and a Nurgle team as well. Undead, of course, a few people would have them as a hybrid. I think, generally speaking, most would call undead a bash team, but not necessarily the bashiest. They can struggle when they get to sort of mid to high TV undead, of course. Uh, so that's the, these are the sort of more killy teams that we've got in G-Man Division 9. Moving on to the hybrids. And I think the thing that stands out straight away are the three lizard teams. That's a fairly high proportion of the division, almost a, a third of the whole division, certainly um, just, well, actually, no, just shy of a quarter of all the teams in the division, being scaly and horrible and lizardy. And alongside them in the hybrid category, we've got humans, underworld, and vampires. Always interesting to see how vampires go across a season we've only had one vampire team ever qualify for the rebel playoffs which is of course bloodsuckers inc um for the vamp i mean they did win division two so it is doable we'll we'll see how the vampire team in division nine gets on this season uh moving on to the ag teams and it, it's fairly straightforward really we've got one high elf one dark elf and one wood elf team so that's i think that's a nice nice blend of agility obviously the bashy teams will be happy to see that they get some armor value seven or occasionally armor value eight players to get their teeth and or claws stuck into but at the same time i think the the agi coaches will be happy to see just five bash teams so that gives them a bit of a chance to maybe develop their teams and not just be massacred every single week okay so now we're going to move on to have a look at the the chances of the team the way i'm going to break down this preview is essentially we're going to have a look at the teams in in order of how i think they are likely to qualify in that in that first place um so this is it, this is partly based on uh, the current state of the team but also 
based a little bit on their record from last season as well. So we've got three categories, as you can see here. We've got the contenders. These are the coaches who I think the teams at the moment are pretty much ready to go and have a run at this playoff spot straight out of the box. So we've got five teams there. One of the Lizards, the Wood Elves, the Dwarfs, the Humans, and the Nurgle team there. Uh, the second category is developers. Now, I wasn't really sure what to call this, and I've gone with developers in the end. This is five teams who I sort of think could have a shot at taking first place. They, they, there's the potential there to have a good season in them, but at the moment, they, their teams probably don't necessarily have all of the skills that they need to really make a run at it. So they'll be hoping to maybe come across some of the other undeveloped teams and all the the lower teams early doors if they can get development on the right players uh, in the uh, in the sort of early to mid part of the season and keep the results flowing in and there's every chance in the latter part of the season they could uh, they could certainly have a good run at it but for now not 100% convinced by by those five teams so a little bit of work to do there and then the last four are the outsiders so these are the four teams who I think would probably I think their target should really be a top half finish uh, certainly based on the records last season it might be it might be a little difficult to turn some of the, the season nine records that we saw from these teams into playoff runs. Certainly when you've only got one spot to play for, you, you're probably looking in in the region of nine, ten wins to really be in with a shot of those um, of that playoff place. And, uh, well, I mean, unfortunately, you've got to call a spade a spade. I don't think these four teams produced anywhere near that last season. So... Um, if they can if they can develop their teams a bit better and improve their play, a top half finish would certainly be a good result for each of them. Um, but a playoff plays might be a little bit uh, too much of an ask at this stage. Okay, so now that all the fancy graphics and all that nonsense is out of the way, I think it's time to get down to the nitty gritty of having a look at these teams. Uh, we've got seven accepted tickets already. Seven of them, of course, therefore not accepted. Um, but hopefully that'll all be done before Wednesday so we can get the the season underway on time. We don't have a fixture list yet, of course. So this is very much just a rundown of the the 14 teams that have been allocated to this division. And we're going to start with the outsiders. Um, so the four teams who were sort of, I don't think, have got too much of a shot of the playoffs. Unless, of course, they, uh, they maybe get a few good skill-ups and a few players that they can build their team around uh, we'll start with the Sneaky Blinders actually the Underworld team uh, who I think of all the teams in, in this division come into the new season with the worst record from season 9 uh, Aromason managing just one draw over the whole season and 12 defeats which is it, it's not great you have to say but the, the team itself isn't too bad we we have a, a tentacles guard Warpstone Trop and any any sort of guard on that big guy is really useful on, on underworld teams. Um, Polly Shelby there is a movement aid RG4 thrower. So if we can get block on that thing just to protect it a little bit, that's that's got the the makings of a really useful player for Aromas in. Um, the other thrower is dodge and extra arms, which is also good to be fair. We're building them in two slightly different ways too. Of course, RG4 and extra arms pseudo the same thing. Uh, give or take a few various scenarios but of course with natural mutation access if you don't roll the edge you just take the extra arms so if Polly Shelby is eventually able to get extra arms if it survives that long that would be an excellent Skaven thrower but I think we do need some sort of skill like block first I know you don't plan to take too many hits on Skaven throwers because the idea is they have the ball uh, and if you're allowing them to take a hit then you've not done your job properly but you know it happens sometimes and it's nice to have a way of protecting the thing uh, John Shelby there is Claw Mighty Blow, and that is everything that uh, an Underworld team needs. You've got to have at least one of these Claw Mighty Blow Skaven Blitzers to have any sort of chance, because you need those things to start bringing in the removals, especially against some of the high armor teams in this division. Uh, things can go very, very wrong for the Goblins if they end up being outnumbered and, and whatnot. Unfortunately, the second Skaven Blitzer is just a rookie, but he's only one SPP away from a level so I wouldn't hate seeing Aroma Sin just trying a, a little vanity pass on that at some point early in the season just to get it that mighty blow level uh, and you would certainly take mighty blow first uh, over the claw it's just that little bit more useful and then you add the claw to that afterwards there's a Skaven lineman with Wrestle who will miss the first game of the season uh, Wrestle Tackle 
wrestle tackle strip potentially a very good way to go with that player um, and then the second Skaven lineman there currently without a level and we'll see which way Romerson decides to go with that and then the goblins at the bottom we got six of them one with two heads and I think generally you'll find that most of the goblins will end up picking up two heads uh, you might consider a dirty player if one of them rolls a double for normals access I think I'd probably like to see dirty player over something like uh, even block goblins are massively disposable and if you can get a dirty player one then I think it's really useful for that removal game um, certainly if, if the Skaven Blitzers aren't quite doing the job with that claw mighty blow okay so that is sneaky blinders uh, we'll move on from them to the sci-fi Sorai who were also uh, in that little group of outsiders uh, Cthulhu Collector has done a, a few seasons with Rebel now uh, lovely, lovely fella. Uh, but I think he did finish bottom of his division last season. Uh, that being said, it was a fairly tough one. He was in one of the the Swiss divisions, which um, was full of quite a few sort of well-known rebel coaches or good quality rebel coaches, if that makes sense. So no no shame in finishing bottom of a, of a division with, um, with the coaches of the like of, of Viking Cop in there. And who else was there, for example? So Toast Guy and Pete as well. Both very, very good coaches. But a final record of 2-2-9 for Season 9 is, is not bad at all. Didn't finish bottom of the table. It was actually ninth out of... Uh, well, we're shown 11. But uh, yeah, ninth out of 10, really. One of those was a, a replacement team. So finishing ahead of the richest tees, Ogres. Um, touchdown difference wasn't great. But again, was up against some high quality coaches there. This is how the team looks anyway. We've got block on five of the six Soros, which is a good start. But I think we're lacking a little bit of development outside of that. The one mighty blow tackle Soros. At the moment, because he's the only one with that skill, he's going to be doing all of the blitzing work on this team. Uh, which I think what you'll tend to find is, and you can see it already, that his SPP ends up so much higher than everyone else because he's just taken so many more blocks. And... He's been given so much more workload than the rest of the team that those casualties will just keep rolling in on that one player. So if that thing was to get hurt, then Cthulhu Collector's going to have a lot of problems. Um, that being said, there's a couple of Sauras within one casualty of maybe picking up Mighty Blow or some more Guard, whichever way Cthulhu Collector wants to play it. His Croxigo is also very good. Only way I can really see that improving is with Block, if we can roll a double on that next level up. And he's only... 6 SPP away from that, so 3 casualties will get that done, or maybe 1 casualty and a cheeky MVP somewhere for Isaac Asimov. Uh, elsewhere, we've got a couple of good skinks. I quite like the way these skinks look, actually. We've not got too much TV loaded into those. So we've got the Movement 9 Sidestep Skink, which is an excellent one-turn threat, and the Sidestep Dive and Tackle Skink is a very useful, annoying threat for getting onto the ball and been a little tricky to get rid of if the opposition don't have all that much tackle if you can get block on that if you can get blood step he'd be great but uh yeah i don't mind having the three rookie skinks at all you want most of your tv on your lizard team to be in in your saurus so if if another one of those skinks maybe levels see what he rolls and if it's not great possibly fire him and just replace him with a rookie uh, 110k in the bank though so if something was to happen to one of the Saurus then he's got the money in the bank to replace and the team overall is not looking too bad you have to say all right next one in the outsiders we're gonna have to go into the, the guys who haven't accepted the tickets yet but we're gonna have a look at Aaron Elfos here the Dark Elf team currently shown 1190 and that's because they have been banged up in the open invitational which happens all the time so we've got three MNG players here uh, Rinrion, Rifil, and Nenho. Obviously, default Dark Elf, elf names on this team. That was coached by Machu. Uh, and I think the, the reason that we this one was put into the outsiders category was again their record from last season was was not the best. They were in Division Eight G and managed two wins, five draws, and six losses. So to be honest, the the losses aren't so much of a, of a concern as just maybe finding a way to turn some of those draws into victories. If you can if you can work out the the secret to do that, then it'll be looking much better. Now, we do have this blitzer here with Blodge Leap, and then plus armor. And I don't like the plus armor pickup there. I know why he's done it, uh, because it is armor busted. 
But the problem being that you've actually just, you've got essentially 30, 30K of wasted TV on that player. And when you're looking to be as efficient as possible, you're probably better off just firing him. It doesn't take too much to level another Dark Elves Blitzer um, straight into Bludge. So I would probably fire that player. I, I might not have fired him if he was just armor busted, but at the same time, having the, the plus armor, minus armor isn't really much value. So I would consider getting rid of that player, saving yourself a bit more TV. And that might help you pick up a, a wizard in quite a few games, which might be of more use for getting the ball down than he would be. Um, with standard blodge leap, but nothing like tackle or strip ball. Elsewhere, we do have a blodge strip ball blitzer at the top and a leap tackler. So this is a better player, Rin Rion here. Uh, his injury is just a standard MNG, so he'll miss the first game of the season, but that's a much better player. We've got a dauntless one here, which is an interesting pickup. Obviously, haven't rolled any doubles yet to get those mighty blow players, but it has to be said that Gedeoth will be useful when we come up against there's a lot of lizards there's nurgle there's orcs in this division so there's a lot of high strength teams so a dauntless player is actually not looking too bad all of a sudden and we've got a movement seven lineman to he's mng uh not 100 percent sure where we'll go with that development but obviously movement seven is better than movement six uh the runner there with block not too much development on him yet and we'll see which way match he wants to develop that three standard linemen and then the two witch elves who aren't very well developed at all so presumably we've had a couple of deaths on on witch elves last season which is where some of this uh, lack of development has come from but yeah the team looking a little bit undercooked for being a whole season old um, and with a, a couple of players that i might consider getting rid of certainly that blitzer there uh, in my opinion should go but we'll see how matthew does hopefully he can improve on his performance from last season and that would be that would be a solid season for him uh, the last team that were down in this section were the Quigwanas, which is a great little lizard name, uh, lizard man team. Extrems team, 150k in the bank, 1360. But again, we're just lacking development on, on these Sauros. We've got one Blodge on, which is nice. Check Hacks here is Movement Buster, which is frustrating, but not the end of the world. Uh, might be worth keeping him around, actually, with Movement 5, but he does have Block. But again, we, we see that we've got a 14 out of 16, a 14 out of 16, and a 12 out of 16 there with, um, with, with these Saurus. So they're not too far away from being a much better team than they currently are. Um, elsewhere, the Croxigor is Stand Firm and Break Tackle, which is an interesting way to go, actually. Um, that makes good use of the Prehensile Tail. So obviously you put him into, into position. You then Your opponent has to knock him over. Because if he doesn't, then that tail's staying where it is. And then we have the option to move the tail to somewhere where it's more useful with the 2 plus break, break tackle dodge. So that's, it's, it's a nice little idea, that, for your Crocs to go. Um, maybe with the lack of guard elsewhere on the team, if we can find some extra guard to help him out, that would be great. If we start coming up against, for example, the dwarfs who might be able to out guard and get some blocks in, then that could be problematic. Uh, the skinks. Uh, okay, we've not got any sort of exceptional super skinks there. We've got a couple of sidesteppers. This one has catch, so in terms of one-turn touchdowns, that's not too bad. Being said, uh, catch, catch is um, an agility skill, so for some reason I thought that might have been a passing skill, but that's just me being a moron. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it certainly helps with one-turn touchdowns, or indeed handoffs, if we are in a spot where we need to do that. We've all seen skinks fail three plus pickups or three plus catches, haven't we? So uh, that little bit of extra help doesn't make things too bad. And it also means that if he's marked up and it's a four plus, it still gives him a 75% chance to catch that ball and then make his three plus dodge away. Thanks to Stunty. So yeah, overall, I'd say, yeah, we're, it's, it's blocking all the Soros, which is good and dodge on one of them, which is nice, but we, we're lacking a bit of development elsewhere on the team. And also we've got four rerolls now that we've got Block on Aldosaurus, I think we can possibly afford to burn one of them and go down to three. Four is a little bit excessive for uh, for the team. They can survive quite well with three. And possibly doing that would save you about 60k. And if you're, if you're down a couple of hundred TV to some different teams in the division, you might be able to pick up something like Slibly or, again, a Wizard, which is very useful for knocking the ball over and then these skinks can sweep in and pick it up. So I'd certainly consider getting rid of that reroll ahead of the new season. Right, so that is the the end of the outsiders as we as we dubbed them there. 
in the little graphic earlier. So we'll move on now to the the teams who I think are, are in, a, in a better spot going into the season. But in terms of challenging for first place, they maybe need a little bit more in terms of development. Possibly just one or two magic players extra. Um... Bloody Mary Queens were the first one on that list. This high elf team coached by Soulforge. And I remember casting one of their games last season. Where, well, as we're about to see, they've got a lot of AG5. And for an elf team, that's really, really good. But at the time that I cast the game, we had AG5 without dodge. And we can see that we've fixed that a little bit. But of course, AG5 is no different to AG4 in terms of if you roll a 1 and you don't have that dodge skill, then you're still going to fall over and cost yourself a team reroll. So getting that dodge in there makes things much better. Um, Horthborn Guavathar, possibly the star of the team, the catcher there with dodge. Again, if we can get a couple more touchdowns on him, we'll get another level. Can blodge up that player, and and he'll be good to go. This lineman here is due a level, so we'll see. I don't know if that's just pending because it's something special, or if you're just waiting to see who his first opponent is. But the, the team's getting there. It's just... We've got quite a lot of development on all of the players as opposed to stacking up one or two superstars. And that does make sense as elves, to be fair. So we've got a thrower with sure hands and accurate. With strength four, blodge blitz is really nice. But again, you'd maybe you'd love to roll that double for the mighty blow there on Lanlathian Undomiel. Uh, Lyman, one guard. Lyman, guard on elves, always great. But you can probably expect him to be dead about three or four weeks into the season because he'll have a big target on his head now with that guard skill. But lots of level two and level three players means that we probably need... If we can rack up a few touchdowns in the in the first couple of games this season so forged, uh, he could end up in a nice spot. But we might need the fixture list to be kind and maybe avoid the dwarfs early on with all that tackle and mighty blow and guard that can make his life such a pain. But there's, there's definitely a lot of potential in this team, and towards the end of the season, we could be looking at a very nicely developed high-off team if they can keep themselves in one piece. It's not like they're lacking players either. Uh, next up among that lot are the Watch, and this is an Orc team coached by Alzir. Their record last season was 3-3-7. There's actually three teams in this section that are 3-3-7. Three, three, It'll be the next uh, three teams that we look at. So here's the watch, this orc team in the, in the bright orange kit. We The first thing that stands out is there's a lot of mighty blow, but possibly not much else. So lots of removal skills. We've got a, a block mighty blow black orc and then three block mighty blow blitzers. One of them with tackle. Carrot, iron found us in there. Uh, Nobby Dobbs, the movement 7 blitzer. You'd love to get something like Blodge on him. He needs one more SPP for another level. But there's potential there. And we Mad Arthur there, the thrower, picking up his obligatory stat up on Rebel Orc throwers. It's always plus movement or plus strength or plus agi. You get one of the three every time. No one takes plus armor. That would be stupid. Uh, Cheery Little Bottom is the only guard on the team, but unfortunately for him is niggled. Um, and we'd really like to get these Black Orcs leveled up as possible. I think that's the weakness in this team. The, the lack of guard across the board is going to be extremely problematic for them when we come into these um, we, we come into these high strength versus high strength games. I think you'd expect the Dwarf certainly to have lots of guard. The Nurgle will possibly be certainly a match for them strength-wise and maybe have a little bit more guard, but we'll see in a moment. But this team, if it gets guard, and I'm going to keep saying the word guard until we get more guard on this team, they, they could be looking quite good, but we'll just have to see how it goes. We'll need the Mighty Blow to fire. Lots of Mighty Blow can get lots of removals, can get some levels on these Blitzers. That would be lovely. But we do need some guard. Okay, who else were in this section? Well, back into to the guys who've accepted the tickets. Erwendor's Requiem. Now, Erwendor is a bit of a rebel stalwart, to be honest. He's been around for, I think, as long as I've been around in this league. I certainly remember playing against him in, in Season 3 uh, and Season 4, that sort of time. Playing Undead these days, uh, again with a 3-3-7 record last season. And this is a lot more developed, but the development isn't necessarily 
ideal in some places, which is, I think, why this went in, into the developers section rather than the contenders. Um, so, again, we've got what I assume is a plus armor, minus armor ghoul. No, it's a niggle, so we're giving him plus armor to protect against the niggle, but to be honest, ghouls are ten a penny, aren't they? So, the armor value, again, a little bit bloody. I might have actually have taken another movement up there. Movement 9 Blodge Ghoul would have been a real threat. Uh, and certainly better than the plus armor that we've taken there to try and protect him. I think, yeah, movement 9 would have been really nice on that player because you would have barely had to get into your opponent's half to have been in scoring range with Alexander Steiner. Uh, elsewhere, we've got a, the, the team, the ordering on the, the players is all over the place. We do have four ghouls, one at the top, and then three at number four, five, and six. Again, we've got an armor six one there with sure hands. He might not last too long there, Elmar Lehepu. Uh, but Charles Francois Teppers is blodge tackle, which I, I think I might have liked to see wrestle tackle on that ghoul um, if we're developing in that way. But not the not the end of the world. The whites are looking okay. Olivier Lasagne there with blodge and mighty blow. Again, it's, it's a tricky one. I wouldn't have minded Blodge so much on a Necro White. But I think with your your Undead Whites, you need to be stacking as many kill skills as you possibly can on these guys. I know that there's quite a bit of Blodge on this team, and we'll come on to another one of them in a second. But we, with the team lacking natural strength access, we do need these Whites to be developing into killers as best we can. And that Strength 4 one there, Paul Therion, is looking really, really good. But of course, taking the strength four early means that it takes him quite a while to get to his second level unless you start feeding him touchdowns. So for the meantime, if uh, Olivier Lasagne might have had tackle, that would have helped him deal with the elves a bit better. Um, but Blodge will certainly help him. It'll keep him alive a little bit longer in theory. Watch this space. And then we need to talk about the mummies because these two things are really, really good. Obviously, both come with Mighty Blow out the, block, the box. Both then have Block Guard. So having rolled doubles on both mummies is excellent, but going even better, Lou Costello has rolled another one for dodge. So a blodge guard mummy, absolutely next on the agenda for that thing is stand firm. Because if you start getting him into horrible positions and then your opponent needs to roll a power against a strength five player to knock him over, it's difficult to do. So absolutely looking at stand firm next on that thing. Uh, and then the zombies, we've got one with block, one with guard... And a rookie, and there's also a skeleton in the team as well, Marcus the Revive. Would, if he gets an SPP somewhere or other, would really like to see that skeleton become a dirty player. If we are going to run a skeleton, we, we want to, that they're cheap as anything, and we want that to be a fouling piece. Just that extra movement helps him get across the field to foul something that's a little bit further out of range. Uh, so that there's potential in this team. It's a little bit wonky in place with a couple of level ups, but overall, that's, it's not looking too bad. And those mummies are exceptionally good. Okay, uh, the final 3-3-7 team were Shock and Gore, I do believe. We'll double-check that. Uh, yes, it was. So the other Undead team, coached by Gruff. Now, the story behind Gruff's Season 9 is one of woe and misery, to put things bluntly. Most of his team died in the early part of the season, and he spent the rest of the season basically saving up enough cash to rebuy his entire team. So... Thankfully, we've got there, and coming into Season 10, not looking too bad. A little bit, maybe a little bit shy in one or two places, but I don't think overall it's it's far off. It's not far off at all, this team. Um, we'll start with the Mummies, and again, both of them have blocks, so only losing out to Irwindor's Mummies because they're slightly further behind uh, in their development, and obviously one of them has Blodge Guard. But again, these are two very, very good players and we can build the team around them. Hopefully they stay alive for Gruff this season. And you have to say credit to him for sticking out last season when um, when things went south very quickly. Uh, a lesser coach would probably have, have thrown in the towel early doors, but he stuck it out He um, and he's, he's not looking too bad. He's been rewarded with some good levels. We've got a tackle at Mighty Blow White there, two SPP away from um, a level up again. That won't take long and it'll probably be piling on. Plague Chew of the Ghoul is Agi4 Blodge. Great Ghoul. Uh, Spine Grinder number 9 is another Blodge one. And then we come on to Corpse Splitter, who... Ah, oh, right, okay, so 
we've gone wrestle first, and I imagine this was going to be our wrestle tackle strip go. And then he rolled a double. And I, I do like the guard pick, but I think it's a frustrating place to have the guard, if that makes sense. So I imagine Gruff looked at that and thought, well, obviously we don't have much natural strength access on an undead team anyway. So I've kind of got to take this guard because I'm lacking it across the rest of the team. But guard on the wrestle player is just strictly less good than guard on the block player because if your opponent rolls a both down, the wrestle player goes to the floor. Sure, so does the opponent, but it means that the guard is no longer in play. Whereas if it was the block player, then um, the guard is suddenly still in play and doing what it's designed to do. So it's a slightly frustrating place to have the guard. It's not the end of the world. But uh, you prefer it on the blodge player. But obviously, once you've already rolled the wrestle, what can you do? Um, finally, we've got Sid and Boris, who are both block zombies. Useful for keeping them on their feet. Don't hate that. Um, Trevor is a dirty player, so happy to see a dirty player on this team. And Trevor will be given plenty of fouling duties to go. And of course, as the more removals we can get, the more chance we've got of getting more zombies. Which is exactly what uh, an undead team wants. Just a bunch of zombies. To think, what they want is to keep cycling their own zombies. If, if Sid or Boris get another level, unless they roll guard, that's probably a firing for them. Uh, and if we can replace them with some of our opponent's players, happy days. Okay, the last team in this particular section were... Um, no, was that all of them? That was all of them, wasn't it? So we now move on to the contender. No, sorry, I've, I've missed a team. Yeah, Hubat. Hubat were the last team, the Vampires. Now, a couple of... When we talk about special luck and players, there are a couple of special luck and players on this team, and none more so than Count Amadan the Vein, who is Agi6 and Bludge. Now, we really are getting there with this Vampire team, aren't we? Bludge step on the first one. Agi6 Bludge on Count Amadan here, and then we've got a Mighty Blow Vampire and another Agi5 Bludge in Count Vorigan Rasputin. So... I think these guys were... They're, they only sit in the developers because vampires are hard to take to first place. Um, but do not underestimate this team at all. One, while we're developing them up, the record last season was 3-4-6. So a total of 13 points. But again, vampires occasionally do take a little bit of time to get up to speed. And this lot are, are really approaching a good, a good place. We'd like to maybe get some pro on some of these vamps sooner rather than later to save those team rerolls every now and then but we've got a wrestle kick thrall which is fine we've got uh the armor value six wrestle probably needs to go the movement five can be line fodder to be honest um although if you want to fire him that's also fine guard thrall is really good would like to see a dirty player uh if we get any of these things leveled up and i think we're also lacking a ball carrier somewhere as well we don't have any sure hands on the team which is going to be an issue against those strip ball elves and uh, and things like that. So we need some sure hands pronto. Whether it's on a thrall or whether it's on a vampire, it doesn't really matter. But we just need some sure hands sooner rather than later. But the, the team are, are coming along nicely. And um, yeah, it, don't be surprised if they if they end up towards the top end of the table here. If, if Paolo B can string together some good results. Right, so now we are on to the five teams that we had listed as the contenders. And the first of those, we're going to have a look at Lava Jackal's Nurgle, chosen of Papa Nurgle. Now, Lava Jackal's been around Rebel for a few seasons. Uh, he's a good coach, and I've got him down as certainly one of the favourites here, because this lot are looking pretty good. Uh, Felix the Beast of Nurgle has guard and is in it within MVP range of another level for stand firm, or block if you're also double. Um, we have a Claw Mighty Blow block Nurgle Warrior. You can see he went block first on all of them, so it's been very slow progress. And then we've managed to get Mighty Blow on all of them, which is good. But again, we do actually lack... There's only the one guard on the team, so... I'd like to maybe see one more of those Nurgle Warriors go Claw, but then I'd like to see the other two go Guard. And probably whichever one gets there first goes Guard before we get more Claw. Um, that being said... The, the team's looking okay, and obviously the natural strength advantage can help them out, depending on how the fixtures go early days. Um, Kerr, the pest to go there, that's your obvious ball carrier. He is Blodge, Extra Arms, and Agi4. So can if the ball gets sacked down by someone else on the team, then 
he can be in hand to pick it up. Bipolar Gore is going to be the Pestigore killer, but at the moment is a little bit underdeveloped, still need a little bit of work to get him guard. So you might feed him a touchdown, give him the opportunity just to help him along his way. But we don't have any other Pestigores, and I think what this team does lack is a ball sacker. We don't have one of those wrestle tackle strip players that can really threaten the opposition. So as, as good as Kerr is at picking up the ball if it goes on the floor, the, the, who is going to get it to the floor is the problem. And we might be relying on bipolar goal to do that without tackle, without strip ball, anything of that nature. So not an easy task for him. We've got a lot of rotters. We've got a total of six rotters there. Uh, one of them is MNG'd. There's seven actually. Uh, thanks to Dangerous Dave. And Dangerous Dave the second is a dirty player, which is exactly what you want from a Nurgle Rotter. If you're not picking up guard, you probably want to pick up dirty players. Um, but again, it's here here or there, I would say. And with those Nurgle Warriors being, a couple of them being very close to another level, it won't be too long until this team starts to look very scary indeed. But if we can just pick up another Pestigore and maybe start developing that too uh, into a sacking player, then it'll be looking really, really good. Right, also on that list were the Big Cups. Now, they're a slightly low TV dwarf team, this one, coached by Uvisac, but their, their record was okay. 3-4-6 again last season, similar to the Vampires. Uh, the reason I've got them ranked so highly, though, is, is that lack of claw in this division. That brings the Dwarfs up into contention. We've only got the one Nurgle team with Claw. Uh, and lots of guard on this team too, which is great. Unfortunately, we've got a couple of Terry Tennant light blitzers here. Um, that one's an Agi bust, which is fine. You can live with that on a long beard, but this blitzer with guard is niggled. And that could, could hurt him. Although, Armour 9, not the easiest to get through in the first place. Uh, all of our killing power comes from one, one troll slayer, Grong Doc Troll. And the problem with that is if you are going to pile on relentlessly to get those removals, you've got to protect him because he's really going to be at risk of the opposition coach just saying, well, okay, I'm going to foul that because I don't want you piling on my entire team every turn. Um, Turim is a blodge runner, which is really good. Always good to have that on a dwarf team because he comes with natural sheer hands, which protects him against those pesky elves. Uh, accurate. I understand accurate because he's clearly rolled a normal. I might have preferred kickoff return to get him closer to the ball. Uh, my major issue with accurate is I don't see who he's passing to with that accurate skill. A couple of blitzers there who are still very much rookies. So this team... Does need a little bit of that. Maybe there was, there's an argument. You could argue to swap the vampires and the dwarfs around, actually. Uh, possibly being a little kind to the dwarfs. But I think that being said, the lack of claw can really help this team develop. And if they can start getting mighty blow on some of those long beards. The next couple of long beards, if, they, if he levels the rookie one, I'd take mighty blow on that first rather than guard. Because I don't. I think we're actually okay for guard on this team. I don't think we need any more guard. So I'd start stacking the mighty blow as much as we can. If the second troll select and get a two, then great. And I would consider picking up a second runner just so you've got somebody else to pass the ball to if that thing gets removed. But uh, he is lower on TV than everybody else. With 90k in the bank, you might consider picking up a 12th player just in case you see that removal. Dwarfs being down numbers is never good. Um, but I think on the whole, there's, there's potential in this team. And as I said a couple of times now, the lack of claw can really help them. Uh, there is that Underworld player, but of course you're just having to deal with one armor value 8 Skaven Blitzer there. So I imagine the Dwarves can deal with that thanks to their guard. But there's potential in the Big Cups. Okay, so I think that's three teams to go now. So we'll have a look at these humans, Hack, Slash and Mutilate. Coached by Jonah. So these are one of the two ramp-up teams from last season who did slot in to a division sort of halfway through. They slotted into the spare gap in Division 10, in 8D, sorry, uh, which is the same division the Cthulhu Collector played in. Uh, they were 4-1-2, though, when they joined that division midway, which is a pretty good record, you have to say, considering you joined a, a division midway through. Um, overall ramp-up record... 
will have not been too shabby either. 7-2-3 across the season. So this is a human coach that knows what he's doing. Um, the team roster is looking fairly good. I mean, there's a few reds and a few greens here and there. We've got Adji Thor in quite a few spots. And that is a good thing. However, we are seeing injuries everywhere. So we've got an Adji, an Adji 2 guard blitzer here. That's not dreadful. We can, we can keep him around. Uh, this dauntless, dauntless guard blitzer is interesting. I might have preferred mighty blow there, but I understand picking up guard. Uh, now this kick, I don't understand kick on this blitzer at all, uh, because going mighty blow first tells me he's going to be our killer. But you can't kick people to death as humans, unfortunately. So that one isn't going to work. But I suppose it does give him kick if he needs it. But I, I, I don't like seeing that on a mighty blow blitzer at all. It's a waste of a good skill slot. So, if anything happens to him, I wouldn't appo it. Uh, Percival is still a rookie, but is at least two SPP of the way it was first level. Uh, the Yoga has guard and is one SPP away, so you'll, you'd imagine he'll pick up a casualty soon enough, and hopefully for Jonah will roll block. Uh, and then we get into sort of messy territory. So, Uthar here is Aji 4 sidestep and leap. Good one turn threat, is niggled. Could get hurt fairly quickly. We'll need to keep an eye on that. Speaking of which... Arm value 7 catcher here in Arthur, who uh, is sidestep and is therefore potentially another one-turn threat if we need him, but again, has potential to also be mangled. Two throwers, and both of them have rolled Adji up. Um, I'd possibly fire Percival. Pendragon here is Adji 4, and is that safe throw? It is safe throw. So obviously he's looking to pass with this team as much as he can. No protection on the thrower, though, in the way of block or dodge skills. Um, Percival is movement busted. I would probably... He's only just got his Adji. I'd probably fire that for what it's worth. You've already got an Adji 4 thrower and you only really need one. Um, and then three rookie linemen and the guard, but unfortunately niggled again. So there's a little bit of lasting damage on this team. But his record is good despite that. So even though some of the levels might be a bit wonky, I think in this division there's every chance that Jonah can make a good run for this. So we will see how he does. be interesting to see how this human team comes along and the sort of decisions he makes about those injured players. Uh, second to last, we're going to look at the Boondock Skinks, who are a 16-20 Lizard Man team, which makes you think, ooh, happy days. However, most of that is on the Skinks. And uh, that's not really the way you want to do it. The Saurus are, are getting there. We've got a couple of block ones. One with Dodge, who's almost at block to make him obviously blodge would be good. The Croxigo is very good. He's got block guard. And if he can get stand firm on that in one casualty's time, then that is a brilliant Croxigo. Uh, block guard on this Saurus as well. So we've got a little smattering of guard to help out the rookies as they try to get themselves up to 6 SPP. But then we've got... I'd, I'd consider getting rid of maybe one of these skinks. Certainly that, that movement busted one. Uh, can probably go. This one has sure hands, so he stays. This one has sure feet, so he mm, maybe stays, but we've got a movement 9-1 as well. I don't think you need both of these players. So based on the fact that that one's 100k and that one's 90k, I'd probably get rid of that one. Um, and then we've got dive and tackle kick. So kick is interesting, actually. You don't often see lizard men teams with kick. But Greenlee comes with that power. And I, I don't necessarily hate that. Kick is always a fairly useful skill. Uh, but you'd expect that'll be the skink that sits off on the side of the field for the first half. But yeah, we can maybe trim the TV of this team a little bit. And if the skink are able to play fairly magic Blood Bowl, then they've got every chance of frustrating a lot of the opposition. There's not all that much tackle in the division. Just the one dwarf team. No chorfs or anything like that. So... Uh, the Skinks could actually have a bit of a whale of a time, depending on how things go. Uh, their record from last season was 4-1-8, which is actually up there with the best records from all the teams that played the full season last time. So again, potential in the Boondock Skinks. Okay, one team to go, and that is the Wood Elves. Sabretooth Vag 3.0, coached by MB Carmack. Um, looking ravishing there in their pink kit. And this is another ramp-up team. So their ramp-up record last season was 
bear with me while I find this in the background. 5-2-1, which is really good. So definitely a team to watch here. They didn't actually find themselves placed into any division before the end of the season, but they'll have had a bit of development in the Open Invitational too. And we have a strip ball tackle dancer and another tackle dancer. So the dancers aren't exceptional, but other than the fact that they are exceptional out of the box, it means that Pushkin and Dumas there are not looking too shabby at all. We'd maybe like to see if we can roll a magic double for Mighty Blow, and this team is looking great. Uh, kick, wrestle, and block on the three linemen is fine, though we're possibly lacking a little bit of dodge on those guys, although to be said they are fodder and will often be killed. Uh, then we've got the catchers. One's a rookie, one is blodge step, which is great for one turns, and the other one is guard, which is also nice. He just has an MNG there, Ulusird. Um, so he'll be back for the second game of the season. And having guard on that catcher, if you can get him in somewhere near a, an exposed ball carry, then it suddenly turns that ward answer block from a one dice into a two dice. And with strip ball or tackle, it really does increase your odds quite a bit doesn't it so yeah that's Sabretooth Vaj again another team who I think can are in position to have a really really strong season um, and it'll it'll very much depend on whether they can keep obviously with Wood Elves you've got to keep things alive there's there's no absolutely outstanding players that everyone is going to want to be the one to kill yet but all it takes is one strength up on a ward answer or maybe a mighty blow and that will change very, very quickly. Right then, so to wrap things up here, I think the only thing that's left to do is for me to get off the fence, if you like, and pick a coach who I think is going to be the one to, to win this division and get the playoff spot. Uh, I give this plenty of thought. There's a few, certainly amongst those contender teams, there's a few who, with the right levels and a good set of results early doors, keeping the team alive could um could see things looking good but i think if i had to pick one as it stands right now my pick is going to be lava jackal and chosen of papa nurgle they um of all the teams in the division obviously it's only one season nurgle but they're in a really really good spot and um i think overall they're the best developed team in the division they've got a coach who I've played against before, and I know he's 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 a good coach. He knows how to handle himself on the field. Does Lava Jackal nice guy as well? Um, and I think at the moment this is the team I'm going to plump for. So there they are, looking resplendent in their horrible sort of purple and gold kit there. But yeah, like I said, it, it's just a couple of casualties here, and we can pick up some guard. One casualty there, and we can pick up some more guard. And suddenly, I think a lot of teams are going to struggle to um, to make tracks against this team. And they can very much just spend the season grinding people down into a pulp and probably have a very, very strong run. So uh, as we wrap up this season preview, that's my pick. My cards are on the table now. I've picked Lava Jackal, and he's been around Rebel long enough to know that that means he's now horribly cursed. But yeah, I think best of luck to all coaches. I'm excited to see how the division goes and we'll um we'll keep things coming with the weekly recaps which will sort of go over what we're going to do is we're going to go over the results we'll maybe have a little performance of the week section um, and we'll obviously what, what i'm not going to do is sort of go through every team every week to highlight as, as we've done today to highlight all of the players but we'll just we'll pick out the sort of key development on players as and when they happen um across the course of the season so yeah that was the first episode of the whole nine yards Catches again after week one.